Sir, my question is regarding topic number one, slide number seventy-three. Here in that slide, uh, we have uh, taken a red spot for the field of study. That is, how do we decide upon the distance between the inlet and that red spot of study? Cylinder. So the question is: This is a circular cylinder shown here by red circle. How do we decide? the position of this inlet boundary. I would like to mention that whenever we have to set up a, this position of this wall, let us say this left wall, right wall, we have to do a study which is called as a domain length independent study. In computational fluid dynamics, there are different studies which we have to do. I will go back to that first slide of mine where I had taken the quote from Albert Einstein, a theory is something which nobody believes except the person proposing a theory. So, to propose that your results which you have obtained is correct, you have to do a various types of study. So, this is one type of study which is called as domain length independent study. You have to do grid independent study, you have to do time independent study if it is a transient problem. So, here to answer to your question, what should be the position of this? This we decide, this varies from problem to problem. Uh, so, we have to do what we call as the domain length independent study. So, we take, let us suppose we have a particular position, we do one simulation, then we increase the length and we start with let us say minimum size of this uh, outer rectangle and we keep increasing it and we keep obtaining the results. Like in this case, the results could be engineering parameters, lift force and drag force. So, you can start with a smaller size of this rectangle and keep increasing it in some let us say elemental increase and for each increase you obtain the engineering parameter and try to see how much is the difference between the results if you keep increasing. And finally, what happens is that this difference should asymptote, this difference should die down and that is what is called as the domain independent uh, lengths of the domain. Okay, so, this is what is called domain length independent study. So, let us suppose inlet boundary is at uh, 5 unit upstream, then you do one simulation at 7 unit upstream, then you do at 10 unit upstream. And if you say that the results between 7 and 10 is negligible as compared to between 5 and 7, then you can say that 7 is good enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have one more question. Yeah, please, yeah, please go, go ahead. ahead. Good evening, sir. Sir, what is the difference between finite volume method and finite difference method? Any similarity or any advantages is there in a finite volume method? Okay. The question is what is the difference between finite difference method and finite volume method? Uh, if you go back to the history of development of computational fluid dynamics, uh, finite difference method uh, uh, was is the first method which was used in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, however, it was found that if we want to use finite difference for complex geometry problems, uh, complex geometry problems are those problems in which case the boundary is not, not aligned along the standard coordinate system like Cartesian coordinate or a cylindrical coordinate. So, in complex geometry problems, uh, if you use finite difference method, people were struggling to solve the Neostock equations. So, uh, this finite volume method was proposed which makes sure that the conservation laws are obeyed to a larger extent. So, and the basis of the finite difference method is a Taylor series expansion. And uh, in the basis of the finite volume method is that we start from the conservation law and apply it to the control volume. So, this is much more accurate as far as the conservation law way is concerned. So, this is the in principle definition which I can highlight and application wise also finite volume is, uh, is e easily able to uh, formulate for the complex geometry problem. And most of the softwares nowadays are finite volume based. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, if, if unstructured grid, which method we can go for? Uh, question is, uh, in an unstructured grid, uh, uh, whether we use finite difference or finite volume? The answer is yes, we use finite volume method because finite difference method uh, you cannot use in case of unstructured grid. 
sir if one more problem is there if you give in finite unstructured grid is beneficial for us mm, the question is whether i can give uh, or talk about the unstructured grid uh, i am sorry to say that uh, the syllabus of the course right now it's a first level course on computational fluid dynamics uh, the unstructured grid solver development is uh, a much more advanced level so in this course it will not be possible however i look forward in future we can have an advanced course on computational fluid dynamics where we can take this sir one more question sir good evening sir sir uh, my question is uh, from exact solutions uh, slide number 7 sir actually here we applied the fully developed condition uh, assuming that the boundaries are subjected to constant wall heat flux suppose let me consider a constant temperature boundary conditions where generally we will assume the fully developed condition as dot t dot x equal to 0 assuming that the bulk mean temperature of the fluid will be equal to the temperature of the walls and uh, we came to know that uh, the heat transformation rate from that point will be equal to 0 so is there any such uh, um um conclusion which we can draw from the uh, constant wall heat flux case by applying the thermally fully uh, developed condition uh so the the question is about uh, the thermally fully developed condition that we have employed here for the constant heat flux uh, situation uh let me let me actually point out that the implicit assumption in these problems is that there is a non zero heat transfer from the the wall to the fluid and therefore the surface temperature will be necessarily different than the the mean bulk temperature if it turns out that uh, if surface temperature is going to be equal to the bulk temperature then of course uh, things are going to be uh, that there is no heat transfer Uh, and i think you pointed out that in the case of constant wall temperature uh, what ends up happening if i if i recall correctly is that the, the eventually the mean temperature will tend to the uh, the the surface temperature so that the difference between the surface temperature and the mean temperature bulk mean temperature will keep on decreasing and will reach to zero thereby no heat transfer in the case of constant heat flux situation actually that doesn't occur uh what ends up happening is uh, there is a constant temperature difference that is established between the wall temperature and the bulk temperature and this constant temperature difference remains as you move along the the x direction um downstream so there is always going to be that non zero heat transfer uh, maintained from the surface to the the fluid which is actually the boundary condition that you are uh, imposing that is the non zero heat flux at the wall Uh, uh let 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 professor sharma also uh, say something on this so if you don't mind waiting for a minute i would just like to add that in constant heat flux boundary condition <coughs> what happens is that uh, dt by dx at any horizontal level at any constant y comes out to be a constant quantity so in constant wall temperature uh, del theta by del x is equals to 0 where theta is the bulk mean te temperature where in this case dt by dx comes out to be a constant quantity thank you yeah yes yes sir uh, one more question sir from sir actually we are getting the exact solutions for the uh, assuming the flow is thermally and hydrodynamically fully developed can we able to get analytical solutions where the uh, flow is hydrodynamically as well as uh, thermally developing uh where we have a different kind of uh, situation if if i am right uh yeah so the the question is uh, we have worked out a solution uh, here where the flow is uh, hydrodynamically fully developed and uh, thermally developing uh, sorry uh, both both is fully developed i'm sorry and the question is if we can uh, if we can obtain an analytical solution when both the hydrodynamical as well as thermal developing flow is considered so uh one step uh, between these two would be a situation where uh, the flow is hydrodynamically developed but is thermally developing and that is what is popularly called in the literature as a grades problem 
and the grades problem is uh, analytically worked out and you obtain a series solution for the for the grades problem uh, so that is a situation where hydrodynamically fully developed but thermally developing flow is considered uh, it's much more involved uh, solution in the sense that an advanced uh, technique uh, that we talked about the kind of technique uh, namely the series solution uh, is, is what is employed and you will find that in standard uh, convection heat transfer books uh, i think i had written a couple of names uh, during my uh, lectures on convection heat transfer books and you will find that uh, i don't i don't think the uh, uh, hydrodynamically as well as thermally developing situation is uh, completely solved analytically i at least i haven't seen it uh, let me ask uh, Professor Sharma if uh, if he has come across the solution of both hydrodynamically as well as thermally developing uh, flow. No, I had also not encountered that, and I don't think it is possible to obtain analytical solution for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, K K I T, please go ahead. K I T, please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, uh, I have uh, two questions to Puranik sir. Uh, one question is, uh, when the particle experiences some uh, different kind of energy transactions and also that uh, moments, then uh, is there uh, any general considerations uh, to couple these terms to that momentum and uh, that energy equations? If the, any general considerations are there, please uh, elaborate that uh, general considerations. And another one question is there, sir. And uh, uh, can you repeat the difference between under relaxation and uh, over relaxation technique, sir? Over, sir. Yeah. So there are uh, there are two questions. Uh, one is if we can talk about the under relaxation and over relaxation a little bit again. Uh, let me take that question first. Yeah. So the concept of uh, under relaxation or over relaxation is always employed with uh, iterative methods of solution. So remember the iter iterative method that we discussed. The iterative method is essentially uh, you start with a guess solution field in the, in the domain and then you keep on improving on that um, guess field using uh, an equation such as what we had used here uh, in, in, the, in the case of that two dimensional steady state situation. But fundamentally, the idea of the under relaxation is described on, uh, or over relaxation also, is described on slide number 17 in the finite difference solution. So what we say is that we, we consider the change in the solution that we obtain through one iterative step and add that to the solution that we had available with us at the beginning of that iterative step and thereby you obtain the solution at the end of the present iterative step. That's the way to physically understand how the iteration is going. So if we, if we are, let us say if we are achieving a certain amount of change in the solution uh, just for the sake of discussion through one iteration step, if we, if we are permitting only a fraction of this change to be added to the, uh, to the solution that was available to us at the beginning of the iteration, we will call this situation as under relaxing. Whereas, if we are permitting larger than 100% change that we have available with us to be added to the, to the solution that we have at the end of previous iteration step, then we call that as over relaxation. Uh, so this is how I actually would like to uh, typically interpret this under relaxation and over relaxation from a purely physical understanding point of view. Uh, what ends up happening is that uh, later on uh, when you complete the discussion on Navier-Stokes solutions, etc., you will realize that uh, many times there is an iterative process of solution involved there. And uh, in the, in the Navier-Stokes equations, which are nonlinear and coupled partial differential equations, you will see that the requirement will always be using under relaxation because otherwise the solution will go out of control. In a very simple situation like what we uh, described and uh, worked on the lab yesterday, the steady state uh, temperature distribution, it's a very simple equation in terms of its mathematical behavior also. And here, the over relaxation uh, seems to also function well. But in general, for the fluid flow equations, it, it's not going to work. Uh, 
so that's about your uh, first uh, or rather the second question the first question was actually related to uh, uh, the governing equations in fact and uh, if we have taken into account all factors that are affecting a fluid particle that's the way at least i interpret the question uh, as the particle is moving whether uh, we have taken into account the energy interactions whether we have taken into account any other uh, interactions such as uh, moments etc and uh, in fact all of that is built in to the governing equations which we have come up with uh, if you want to look at the moments on a differential fluid element we uh, we actually if you remember we actually took um, counter clockwise moments of the the surface stresses which then were only in terms of the uh, the shear stresses about the center point for that elemental fluid uh, uh, mass that we were talking about and we in fact obtained a result through some sort of a discussion that the result of that momentum uh, angular momentum equation so to say for a differential fluid element is that the shear stresses occur in pairs so tau ij was equal to tau ji is what the conclusion then that we obtain also the energy interactions occurring for a fluid particle are taken into account when we when we derived the energy equation only thing is as we were discussing earlier also in this q and i session some of the details of the energy equations were were uh, omitted as part of the simplification so the only part that was omitted was essentially the effect of viscous forces on the energy transfers and that is the only part that was omitted under the assumption that we are dealing with uh, with simple low speed flow situations where the action of uh, viscous forces in the energy interactions is negligible but otherwise all interactions are built into our uh, governing equations without any trouble so thanks thanks for that there is another question sir uh, for sharma sir uh, there is another question and it is on topic number 2 slide number 29 uh, what stability requirement exactly means to us about stability requirement and is what the stability requirement exactly means uh, <coughs> the idea here is that uh, if you want to understand that when you do an unsteady computation you march in time what happens is that uh, as time progresses uh, there is some discretization error which is there in the at each time step now the idea is the error this what happens to the growth of this error with respect to time if the error grows with respect to time then what happens is that this temperature value approaches towards infinity and this is what we call as blowing up of the solution okay so there is a stability analysis which uh, we do more on a numerical analysis course and if you want to look into the details i would suggest you to look into the book computational fluid dynamics by j d anderson where he has shown how we derive this equation okay so this mathematically using von neumann criteria we derive this expression which and this expression gives an expression that what is the minimum time step which we should use in an explicit method and this is a function of the grid size and the thermophysical property which is thermal diffusivity okay so for more reference i would suggest you to follow the book at this moment i would i can say that this expression comes by a mathematical procedure and to calculate that minimum time step which we should use maximum time step sorry in an explicit method thank you Uh, hello sir uh, uh, another one question uh, from this side uh, sir uh, at the boundary uh, the variables are uh, highly sensitive that means what can we take care of uh, that one uh, uh, in case of grid generation sir the question is at the boundary the variables are very sensitive can we take care uh, in grid generation uh, whatever i could understand from this question uh, what happens in fluid mechanics is that the maximum gradient or let us suppose most of the action uh, in fluid mechanics occurs near to the solid surface 
So, near to the solid surface especially if it is a turbulent flow uh, there is a certain uh, minimum grid size we should have near to the wall to capture the flow phenomena accurately near to the wall. So, in grid generation the, the answer to your question is yes we have to take into account that the grid size should be small enough near to the solid objects. Thank you. Nitya Minakshi Bangalore please ask your question. So, regarding finite difference solution 7. How the spatial coordinates varies for the stretching and next question is the stability criteria is exactly equals to 0.5. In that case which method we have to prefer? The question is on uh, slide number 7 of finite differencing and uh, let me uh, let me answer the stability part first. Uh, here the, the stability uh, condition is shown as uh, the kinematic viscosity times the time step divided by the grid spacing squared uh, should be less than half. Uh, in fact, uh, just before this question the stability criterion was being discussed and uh, Professor Sharma also pointed out that uh, in the case of explicit methods using a mathematical technique called the von Neumann uh, stability analysis for simple situations like what we are describing here uh, diffusion equation uh, which is a linear uh, equation. Uh, we can find out that there is a restriction on the time step once we decide the, the grid size. In other words, uh, if, if, we if we choose that the grid size is fixed at certain value delta y, then we cannot arbitrarily take the time step value as anything. But if we want to employ this explicit method, the time step should be less than one half multiplied by the grid spacing square divided by the, the diffusion coefficient which is the kinematic uh, viscosity here. So, this condition comes through a formal mathematical analysis which we have not uh, discussed. The reason is that that forms under uh, a numerical analysis part uh, and as Professor Sharma mentioned a few minutes back uh, if you if you want to refer to the book by John Anderson, uh, he has outlined the, the von Neumann uh, stability analysis and specifically the criterion which is sitting on the on the slide uh, here has been derived for a diffusion equation in, in that book. So, I, I would request that uh, that is where you would like to uh, go and, and look at it uh, for details. May I, uh, may I ask you uh, to repeat the first part of the question, actually I did not get the first part, sorry. So, in the differential sorry in the finite difference solution 7, so how the delta y values varies for the stretching? So, the, the question is on the grid spacing uh, in, in slide number 7 on, um, on finite difference solution and I think if I understand your question uh, uh, you are you are asking whether the, the grid spacing is changing from uh, one end to the, the domain to the other end of the domain. Uh, using some sort of a stretching function, which essentially means that you are talking about you are talking about uh, uh, non-uniform grid uh, sizes as you go from one uh, end to the other. Uh, in this particular case, we have chosen to use a uh, uniform grid spacing so that there is no stretching of the the grid points or the grid size as you go from one location to the other. Uh, this is the most simple uh, situation where you have a uh, grid generated uh, with a uniform grid spacing. So, that delta y remains the same between any two uh, uh, pair of uh, uh, pair of grid points or node points. Uh, I, I, I hope that is what your uh, question was. Uh, VIT Pune please go ahead with your question. Uh, my question to Puranik sir, slide number 39 and 40. Yes, yes, please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, my question related to the slide number 39. As for uh, temperature di non dimensionalization, you have made it with uh, temp this uh, 39 slide number for a differential analysis. Yeah, go, yeah, ahead, go ahead, please. please. So, there you have made a, uh, this uh, non dimensionalization of a temperature. For rest of the things you have taken as a direct values, for here the uh, difference of temperatures you have taken. Temperature difference for non dimensionalization. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the question is on the non-dimensionalization that uh, we employ um, in, um, in the governing equations, specifically the temperature non-dimensionalization 
is done in the form of uh, ratio of temperature differences whereas all other are uh, l let's say the length scale divided by length scale so there is no differences elsewhere but only for the temperature uh, this is actually following the the standard treatment in in non dimensionalization of energy equation see typically in the case of uh, energy equation we are talking about uh, heat transfer and heat transfer will always occur only when there is a temperature difference between two two bodies uh, in in the case that we are talking about it's the temperature difference between let us say a surface and the fluid that is flowing past the surface so it's just a standard convention that we talk about the temperature non dimensionalization using a uh, ratio of uh, temperature differences and to me at least the understanding is that uh, only through the uh, the existence of temperature differences we can talk about uh, heat transfer so it makes sense in in that fashion also many times uh, what you will see is that this fully developed uh, conditions also in case of internal flow uh, uh, with with heat transfer will be coming in the form of uh, the derivatives actual derivatives of such temperature differences being zero so that's also one additional uh, let's say uh, uh, feature because of which we we end up using these uh, temperature differences to find the uh, uh, non dimensional temperature at least that's what my understanding is uh, let me let me ask professor sharma if he has any anything more to add because he works more in uh, heat transfer than i do i would like to uh, mention that whatever professor pranik has mentioned uh, about the constant wall temperature this is the way we do uh, but the other boundary condition standard boundary condition is constant heat flux if that is the case then in the denominator we do not have a reference temperature that is which is, sh is shown here then in that case what we typically do is we uh, take the temperature difference like uh, in let us say if say uh, flow over a pipe in which pipe is having a constant heat flux boundary condition typically then we non dimensionalize the T minus T infinity divided by uh, the constant heat flux let us say QW into the diameter of the pipe uh, divided by k okay so in a constant heat flux this denominator is different constant wall temperature is the way we non dimensionalize thank you sir uh, next question is about the differential analysis slide number 40 you have made the dimension non dimensionalization of the equation number 2 you could not understand that second equation is concerned do by do x star into dx star by dx that part particularly Uh, so the question is on uh, how this uh, non dimensionalization is proceeding um, in in the case of this continuity equation so actually what has been done here which is projected on the slide here is uh, simply look at the first term in the continuity equation which is partial derivative of u with respect to x just look at this because the other one is exactly the same the partial derivative with respect to x now we are trying to convert everything into these uh, different coordinates so to say from the dimensional coordinates x and y to the non dimensional coordinates x star and y star so in one way what we are doing is that we are coming up with a coordinate transformation and accordingly the 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 dif differential equation is also going to change into a uh, into a space where we are talking about the non dimensional coordinates so if you look at a uh, partial derivative with respect to x all that we do is we express that partial derivative with respect to x using the chain rule where the the chain rule will then say that it is partial derivative with respect to x star multiplied by the change in the x star with respect to x that is the standard uh, expression from the chain rule of partial differentiation and then if you go back to the way the coordinate transformation is defined it is x star equal to x over lc where lc is that characteristic value or a reference value which is essentially a constant so therefore when it comes to evaluation of this uh, derivative of x star with respect to x we simply go back to the uh, the expression with which we have related the the two coordinates and if you if you differentiate this x star with respect to x what we will have is equal to 1 over lc so dx star dx meaning differentiate x star with respect to x and this will be simply equal to 1 over lc and that is what is substituted for this dx star dx where my highlighter is standing 
similarly then what remains is the the u velocity inside the partial derivative and going back to our uh, non dimensional definitions u star is simply equal to u divided by uc that's the way we have uh, defined our non dimensionalization therefore u if you just do the cross multiplication will be u star multiplied by uc where uc is a constant value for the characteristic value of the velocity and that is what is written out here inside the bracket where you have u it is getting replaced with u star multiplied by uc uc is a constant uh, so it it's actually going to come out of the differentiation altogether dx star dx is equal to 1 over lc as we just described so that there is a constant factor of uc divided by um, lc which is going to then remain as a constant factor multiplying partial derivative of u star with respect to dx star and that is how uh, the 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 step is getting simplified exactly the same uh, multiplying factor will come out of the non dimensionalization of the second term where my highlighter is standing so there it will be a partial derivative of y which is expressed using the chain rule of derivatives and the v velocity is expressed as the non dimensional v velocity multiplied by the characteristic velocity so this uc over lc will come out as a common factor from both terms and that's what is shown on the third step uh, so it's this entire non dimensionalization exercise whether you look at the continuity now or whether you look at the x momentum y momentum and the energy is looking at each of these terms and utilizing the chain rule of par partial differentiation first and replacing the velocities uh, with their corresponding non dimensional counterparts and then simplifying that's that's all it yes, is yes sir over and all thank you mm -hmm.